Now we're going to introduce Maxwell, who's going to be talking to us about um, the custrian uh, mineralization of carbonates using microbes um, in the Green River Formation. So he's going to stand right here, and Buddy's going to have to do the same thing. <laughs> I have plus animation, so it should be a little bit more. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, this is one of my favorite events at APG, and I'm uh, really excited to be a part of it. Um, so I, my name is Max Palmer. I'm a senior geological advisor at the Green Center for Office of Mineral Oil Resources. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my postdoc at Colorado School of uh, did two, three years ago with Rick Sarge. So motivation for this project is to understand the genesis of dolomite and green river formation, uh, specifically how uh, alien environments, organic matter, and microbial activity interacted with these dolomites. So we're looking at about 300 meters uh, dolomite mud. Uh, this is the Hell's Hole Canyon outcropping in the eastern end of the basin. Um, this dolomite mud can be quite rich. Organic matter content varies. Uh, the mahogany bed, which forms a prominent ridge, is very rich. It can have up to 45 meters or so. Um, further down the canyon, you can see there's tan beds of the lower Green River. Uh, these are um, sandstones and carpets. There. So uh, yeah, we're going to tear these rocks apart, but we'll get some background. So the Green River Formation is comprised of the clustered carbonates and siliciclastid. So the plastics deposited uh, from the early to Middle Eocene uh, in mid-latitude in the Basin. There's three lakes, and we're going to focus on Lake Uinta, uh, specifically in these two study areas. One is near Delta, and one is removed. Um, deposition occurred in warm, temperate, and subtropical climates. And very importantly, deposition spans the early Eocene climate off. Uh, this corresponds to the highest global temperatures and CO2 concentrations in the sun. So, and this is the point I'm going to come back to as we discuss this. But paleoclimate heavily influenced the clustered environmental conditions, sedimentation, and diagnosis, especially the formation of global climate. All right, this is a pretty big data set. Um, <laughs> Uh, comprised of uh, stratigraphic, petrographic, and geochemical data that we'll get here. This allows for a, a detailed understanding of the system and a robust interpretation of its genesis. Uh, we measured about uh, more than 2.7 kilometers of measurement of section from two outcrops of three cores uh, from the western side of the basin and from the eastern side of the basin. Um, from these, we did a lot of photography and geochemistry, uh, including a lot of bin sections. Uh, we did SEM. Electromagnetic field on some of these. Um, we did look at some iron polished surfaces of mud rocks at this year. And then we did x ray diffraction and model mineralogy. Um, and then my favorite part is the carbon oxygen carbonate and the nitrogen carbon isotopes. All right, so we're just going to jump right into the data set. So here's a cross section spanning in the basin. Um, uh, these sections have uh, face sheets and rock fabric plotted in the left, composition of porosity. Right. Uh, the outcrops of uh, that is Highway 191 and Hell's Hole Canyon. Uh, these are nearly complete sections of the Green River. However, the top portion is uh, often is ambiguous. Uh, this is because it interfingers with the overlying formation. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop. Okay. Um, all right. All right, so the Green River topography is very complicated and there's a lot of confusing nomenclature. Uh, so what we've done is we've simply split the Green River into the lower Green River, which is comprised of everything below the demarker bed, and the upper Green River, which is comprised of everything above the demarker bed. It's been quite prominent. Um, as you can see, at a core scale, uh, in the western side of the basin, the section is much thicker and contains much more abundant crystals and plastics like this. Um, the lower Green River in uh, throughout the basin is comprised of intervented residues of plastic carbonates. However, uh, near the fluvial source, uh, these tend to be bioplastic and nitritic calcite. Um, and far away from the fluvial source, these tend to be microbial, fluidic. Uh, there are some regards, but things tend to be more um, Coming into the upper Green River, uh, the lake expanded dramatically, uh, and we see, it, especially in the east side of the lake, the strata is dominated by organic matter. Rich in organic matter, lean, dolomite muds, uh, that really make up uh, this section. Browns. Um, 
Uh, fluvial influence continues uh, near the delta in the east side of the basin. And you see some plastics, but we do see it goes to mud, it just tends to be a little bit uh, Organic matter is most abundant at the mahogany bed. Uh, this represents the culmination of the expansion. Um, and that also marks the onset of abundant uh, sodium carbonate cataclysts. So uh, All right, so we're going to go through the outcrops and the core and petrography and isotopes on the east side of the basin uh, because this talk is abbreviated and because this was uh, really illustrate the trend for the All right, here's some uh, pictures of the rocks. So the lower Green River in the eastern part of the study area. Uh, is comprised of integrated carbonates and source plastics. Uh, the carbonates tend to be oolitic, uh, microbial, or microbial. Uh, microbialites come in a variety of flavors. They can be thrombolytic, uh, they can be filmal, they can be uh, digitate, they can be laminar. Uh, these are, in my opinion, like, these are the coolest microbialites I've ever seen. I recognize field trip is the original microbialites. Um, uh, oolids can be uh, cerebroids. So and they can actually grow um, into centimeter scale negatives. So they are really their proper spheres as opposed to encores. So also well, most of these carbonates are uh, dolomitic, or dolomitic, at least partially dolomitic, except the bioplastics that are uh, they tend to be calcite. Um, the dolomite in these rocks, some of it is sucrosic. Uh, we do see some of this. We interpret this as sucrosic. However, most of it is very biophysical. Great example is this is this uh, oolid on the upper right edge that shows that the cortices are comprised of radially oriented dolomite as well. Um, I interpret these to uh, this to suggest that these, this dolomite was precipitated directly from lake water, forming this oolid as a big replacement. Whether that's difficult. All right. Uh, again, as the lake uh, the lake expanded coming into the upper Green River strata is dominated by organic matter rich, organic matter lean dolomite buds. Uh, these are all laminated, uh, and some of them are even these oral shell branches, which are really organic matter rich. Um, yeah, and uh, organic matter again is much is most abundant. So uh, these contain these can contain uh, abundant uh, pseudomorphs of sodium carbonates like noctilite, uh, like these. Crystals up here, we call this the starry night patients. It's just uh, these were noctilite, but they've been replaced with albite and quartz. Albite's in green and quartz in red. So yes, maps. Dolomite is dominantly zoned with magnesium calcite cores coated in near scope geometric dolomite and then a thin uh, uh, brown dolomite overlay. Uh, this is a, uh, we'll come back to this. This is, this is pretty important. But, um, yeah, this is very characteristic, but not always. Sometimes it's just plain old dolomite. Uh, Alphagenic feldspars, uh, agillaria and albite, especially, are very common as well. Here they're shown floating in this organic matter, which we use. So note that um, oh, uh, case bars in yellow and uh, albites, sodium feldspars. Uh, note that this image has a lot of organic matter. A lot of these rocks are actually sapophiles that have more organic matter than they do. All right, so the stable isotopes really help to build up the story. Um, they give crucial insight into paleo environments and microbial processes. So here we have the stable isotopes for carbonate at Hellsville Canyon. Oxygen and carbonate is plotted in green. Carbon and carbonate is plotted in red. In the lower Green River, uh, they're highly variable and they're largely covariant. However, we do see some positive excursions in the carbon associated with organic battery floods, which are visible here in organic productivity. And possibly some of the but it's nothing like Deer Green River, where the carbon and oxygen signals couple in these large positive excursions, carbon isotopes, uh, corresponding to the cyclic deposition of the organic matter rich dolomites. Uh, these positive excursions are suggestive that methanogenesis was widespread and contributed lots of outworlds in the system. Oxygen isotopes through this part of the stratigraphy are relatively static, except for at the top. Um, where they decrease, uh, this is when you, the UN is starting to come in and get fresh. All right, so here's the nearby core. This is the coyote washboard for the USGS core. I right, taking a look. Uh, I think I read it. Most of the USGS uh, reserved in uh, Denver is a, a big section. 
Um, so there is a lot more data here. So we have carbon and oxygen and carbonate plotted again and red and green respectively, but we also have nitrogen isotopes, carbon isotopes, and organic. Uh, there's also data from this PIP in 1996 study, which I plotted in there. It's, it's the stuff that's not, not in the lines. Um, we see the same trends that we saw in the outcrop. Uh, this transition into the upper Green River corresponds to positive excursions uh, in carbon isotopes that were going through the uh, interestingly, though, the nitrogen isotopes show uh, excursions that mimic the carbon. Um, and we see these positive excursions up to about 20 per mil associated with those organic matter rich filaments. Uh, this is suggestive uh, that uh, the denitrification influenced the system as well, breaking down organic matter generated by the system. Uh, uh, volatilization of, uh, of ammonia could happen as well, but we would expect in modern lakes where that occurs, we see much more positive. Interestingly, uh, the carbon isotopes in organic matter are near stat are, are relatively static, especially relative to the carbon isotopes in carbon. Uh, this suggests that these came from different sources. And our interpretation is that the organic matter, uh, the carbon in the organic matter, was sourced from atmospheric CO2 during photosynthesis, as opposed to the benthic carbon that was incorporated in the carbonate uh, as it was precipitated. Others have suggested that uh, the organic matter in the Great River could have formed from benthic microbial mats, but this suggests that that's not the case. All right, so let's tie all this together into a comprehensive interpretation. Uh, first, we're going to talk about how the paleo environments and microbes evolved, and then we're going to fold it in and talk about the dome and the trends. So we interpret trends in sedimentation, uh, diagenesis, and stable isotopes, the uh, resulting uh, primarily of paleo environmental and microbial processes. The lower Green River, uh, the climate was warmer, uh, arid, and more monsoonal. The lake was much smaller and was heavily influenced by fluvial processes and evaporation. Uh, it was relatively oxygenated and a variable alkaline density. This resulted in widespread intervented carbonate from solution plastics. Uh, oxygen and carbon isotopes and carbonates are variable, covariant, and largely consistent with what we expect in the waters. Uh, most microbial uh, activity is restricted to the coral and subatoral microbialites. However, there is some minor breakdown of organic matter in the upper environments. Uh, things changed a lot in the upper Green River. The climate was more cooler, more humid. The lake was expanded and had diminished global influence. Uh, this resulted in increased organic productivity, treated oxygen, high uh, This resulted in accumulation of organic matter, dolomite muds, sodium carbonate, still spars, steelites. Um, static carbon isotopes and organic matter relative to the carbon isotopes of carbonate suggests that organic matter was sourced from plankton, not benthic photosynthesis. And then periodically enriched periodic enrichment of uh, carbon isotopes and carbonates and nitrogen isotopes and organic matter suggests that widespread nitrogenesis and denitrification generally prolific amounts of alkaline system. And this is evident with the abundance of uh, dolomite and also the not really Really All right, so back to the question at hand the dolomite. Widespread, it's heterogeneous, and it reflects dynamic late chemistries of precipitation. In the lower Green River, the dol dolomites dominantly hosted microbialites and these chemicalites. Uh, these rocks aren't always pervasive, 100% uh, dolomite. There's a lot of mixtures going on. Um, this contrasts the upper Green River, where uh, most of the strata is dolomite mud is associated with organic. Rock fabric and isotopes suggest that both direct precipitation and replacement of precursor carbonate uh, occurred in certification uh, in near certain environments. However, this is ambiguous, uh, contentious, and difficult to prove. Uh, one thing for sure, though, is dolomite formation was heavily influenced by microbial processes. Uh, the first way that um, this occurs, and that we've seen this from the isotope, is that a lot of alkalinity was generated with the cave organic matter, primarily the thermogenesis. Uh, the other mechanism is by providing favorable surface chemistry for nucleated uh, elements. Uh, there's a large growing body of work from uh, modern lab and uh, studies of alkaline lakes um, that shows that, especially in alkaline lakes, uh, a lot of microbes can secrete extracell extracellular polymeric substances. That's a big word. Um, that can help to dehydrate uh, magnesium and uh, catalyze the precipitation of microbial carbons. It's a way to get over that kind of problem. Show this in the lab uh, and in modern uh, 
out of links. And we see direct evidence of this in the rocks. So this image in the upper upper right, uh, this is a single lamination of a stromatolite in the upper zone. And you can see we have calcitic shrubs and dolomite has grown on where that microbial biofilm would have been shrubs. Right? So it's using that surface to actually make dolomite. So it's great. We see evidence of what we show in the lab and the rocks. I love it. It's awesome. Um, this could also explain some of the zoning from magnesium calcite dolomite, uh, where you have more stoic geometric crystal fertile. Um, and then lastly, you see these fertile and dolomite overgrowths uh, that return to a form stagnant, oxygen depleted, and alkaline poor waters of iron produced. So these would be like the profile. So just to wrap it up, um, a climate-driven transition occurs between the lower Green River and upper Green River. Uh, the Pippa Rain is early in the summer coming up. Paleo climate, environmental dynamics, and micro microbial processes global, which go sedimentation, near surface diagenesis, stable isotopes, stable isotopic systems. Microbial decay of organic matter in funnel environments, especially methanogenesis and nitrification, generated prolific amounts of alkalinity in the system. This resulted in enrichment of carbon isotope and carbonate up to about 16, 16 per mil, and enrichment of nitrogen isotopes and organic matter up to about 18 per mil. Um, and lastly, microbial, and most importantly, microbial processes and organic matter strongly impact the colonization. If this by generating alkalinity from microbial, microbial decay of organic matter, by providing favorable surface features. Um, all right, and, and thanks. Uh, this is a project with a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for helping me out Especially my faithful field assistant, George. <laughs> He's a good boy. I just have a pretty picture of us. So, yeah, thanks so much, guys.